Welcome to Beyond the Ocean. Here's a clip from today's guest. People say oh, artificial waves, and I like to say that, hey man, they're not artificial waves. I've ridden them. They're man-made waves. It's like calling a surfboard artificial. Surfboards aren't artificial, even though they're made from petrochemicals. Surfboards are made by hand, and these waves that these uh, wonderful entrepreneurs have created, Tom Lockfeld and Kelly Slater and the guys from Europe, Wave God, and I've, I surfed the, their first prototype wave a number of years ago in Spain. I like to think that they're man-made. There's nothing artificial about getting a six-second tube ride on Kelly Slater's wave pool or doing a huge, beautiful carving turn. The sensation is not exactly the same, but the sensation is similar. The sensation is a very connective mind, body, and soul. There's nothing artificial about it. Caught my first tube this morning. Welcome to Beyond the Ocean, the podcast exploring surf parks and the impact of technology on the future of surfing. We speak with technology leaders, investors, operators, and surfing legends to explore this exciting new movement. I'm your host, Chris Klusner. Hello, and welcome back to Beyond the Ocean. We're joined today by a living surfing legend, Mr. Sean Thompson. Sean is a former world surfing champ, U.S. Surfing Hall of Fame inductee, and has been described as one of the greatest and most influential surfers of the century by Surfer Magazine. Sean is a motivational speaker and advocate for positivity. Specifically, his best-selling books feature The Surfer's Code, which he'll talk about today, And the surfer's code refers to a positive affirmation and attitude towards positivity related to surfing and the experiences that surfing can provide, which is so important as we look to the future of surf parks and wave pools. Sean's also active in the surf park community. He was a participant and speaker at the first ever surf park summit and will be returning again this year in October 2021 to present again at the surf park summit. Sean has shared the stage with famous individuals and leaders like Sir Richard Branson and author Malcolm Gladwell, and he's just a treat to speak to. So I welcome you to enjoy this conversation with Sean Thompson, Champion Surfer. Hi, Sean. Thank you so much for taking the time today. Pleasure, Chris. I'm coming to you from uh, Santa Barbara in California. How's the weather out there today? Weather is very smoky, very sort of oppressive. We have this low cloud with smoke, so it's a really unusual uh, condition. Strange times with the fires and the water conditions and the pandemic. Uh, Tough times for California these days. Yeah, it's very tough, I think, globally for everyone. You know, this will pass. It's interesting that today's the anniversary of 9-11. What a terrible time that was for the world and for the United States. But it ultimately, you know, these calamities and tragedies and catastrophes pass. I love the optimism there. And um, have you been able to get out in the water at all lately? I get out there. Santa Barbara is pretty much a winter spot. We actually face south. So South swells don't get us because of the Channel Islands, They're blocked off by the Channel Islands chain. But northwest swells get in here and west swells get in here nicely. So from October onwards, it's a tremendous surfing time all the way through generally April, May. So looking for the season to start. But you know what's great about surfing and my relationship with surfing? I mean, I've been surfing a long time. I caught my first wave in, in 1965. That Even if you can't get out there on that particular day, I like to say I, I could still catch a wave in my mind. <laughs> As a surfer from New York, I find myself doing a lot of mind surfing. And so I definitely can attest to the value of that. You've talked a lot about that, the connection with nature and the mindfulness component of surfing. I'm curious if you might just walk us through some of your early uh, surfing career successes and also some of the, the moments of your career that stand out as most mindful today. Well, I've been surfing a, a really long time. I caught my first wave in, in 1965. I think I caught my first uh, wave body surfing 
in the early uh, 60s, uh, my father was a great lover of the beach and the ocean lifestyle. He was a lifesaver, a body surfer, champion swimmer. He won the South African Junior Swimming Championships in, at 13 years old. And you know, he wanted to go on and compete ultimately in the Olympic Games. But he got really badly attacked by a shark in Durban, South Africa, which is where I grew up. So that destroyed his swimming career. But he always had this amazing passion and love for the ocean. And uh, even though he had a career-ending shark attack, he still never lost this passion. And he transferred the passion onto myself and my brother and sister. And so our earliest memories of, of being associated you know, with the beach and with surfing, only the good aspect of the surfing lifestyle. So I was very aware of the dangers, but also of the you know, wonderful moment of fulfillment and exhilaration that you could get from surfing. So I had a deep passion from the moment I caught my first wave on a little surfboard in 1965. And then ultimately, I went on to a successful pro career. I won 19 major pro events, surfed in my first pro event in 1969, the Gunston 500, which is still the longest running pro event in the world. It's now transitioned to, it was transitioned to the Mr. Price Pro and then the Bolido Pro. And my dad started that first event, so I had a long association with pro surfing, retired from the pro tour in 1990, built two successful companies in surfing. One was called Instinct, it was a market leader in the 80s. Another one was called Solitude that I founded with my wife, Carla. I worked for some great companies, was sponsored by some great companies. I've had a, a relationship with O'Neill Wetsuits uh, my entire life. You know, I was friendly with Jack and his son, Pat. I worked for Patagonia for a couple of years. Actually, my first real job after I retired from pro surfing. Uh, you know, won events all over the world, won the world championship in 19. 77, helped create professional surfing, helped build the surfing industry. So I've really been in, involved in a very positive way with so much good in professional uh, surfing. And in surfing as a lifestyle, I sponsored two young surfers who ultimately went on to become world champion. Uh, when I had my company Instinct, I sponsored Tom Carroll to two world titles. I sponsored uh, in 84 and 85, sponsored Barton Lynch to a world title, I was, uh, all, both Australians in 1988. Uh, sponsored many other young surfers through their uh, careers. I was the first pro surfer ever to be involved with Surfrider Foundation. I was their first ambassador. In fact, I wrote the copy for their very first ad, Do a Good Turn Today. I wrote those five words in, in 1985 and have been involved with them ever since. I was a board member for Surfrider Foundation, a board member for Boys and Girls Club, ambassador for Boys to Men Mentoring. Since I retired from the tour and sold my... Um, my surfing-related businesses, both Instinct and Solitude. I started writing books. I wrote a couple of, of popular books. One was called Surfer's Code, the 12 Simple Lessons for Riding Through Life. And then I wrote another one called The Code, which was designed and written for teenagers to encourage positive decision-making by creating a value-based personal code. I made a film called Busting Down the Door, with, which many people have seen about the transition in 1975 and 1976 from a lifestyle to a sport, even though the lifestyle element is the most integral part of, of surfing, how we created a sport that spun off from the lifestyle with my friends, Robert Bartholomew, Ian Cairns, Peter Townend, my cousin, Michael, and how we built surfing into what it is today. And it, it, it's been a wonderful journey for me. Also, I've had a long involvement with wave pools. I surfed in uh, my first wave pool in 1985, which was the first time a wave pool in Allentown, Pennsylvania, was used as a venue for a professional surfing event. And it was an event that counted towards points on the World Professional Tour. And I remember going out there and surfing in these little two to three foot, three footers. And it was an interesting experience, very difficult and, and challenging to ride these teeny waves. And it's amazing to see how the technology has developed. Then I, I remember opening a wave pool in the 90s for a guy called Sol Kirsten, an amazing hotel entrepreneur, perhaps the greatest hotel entrepreneur of all time. He created the Lost City in South Africa, Sun City. He created Atlantis. He created the one and onies. I mean, elite hotel destinations. And he phoned me up. He said, Sean, we're having the Miss World surfing, the Miss World beauty pageant. And we'd like you to ride the first wave at the Lost City. We can have this wave pool. And he said, we want you to ride that first wave. And then Miss World's going to be waiting on a horse. And we want you to jump on the horse and then ride off into the distance. And uh, I, I remember I opened that. That was quite an interesting uh, experience. 
So certainly I've really watched closely what's been happening with the technology. I've surfed Kelly's wave pool a couple of times. You know, people have called me up and said, oh, Sean, you know, we're doing this wave pool project. Would you like to be involved? And I've been pretty close to getting financially involved in a couple of projects. But at this time, it's just been sort of a wait and see for me. And, and I'm a big fan. People say oh, artificial waves. And, and I like to say that, hey, man, they're not artificial waves. I've ridden them. They're man-made waves. It's like calling a surfboard artificial. Surfboards aren't artificial, even though they're made from petrochemicals. Surfboards are made by hand. And these waves that these uh, wonderful entrepreneurs have created, Tom Lockfeld and Kelly Slater and the guys from Europe, Wave God, and I've I surfed the, their first prototype wave a, a number of years ago in Spain. I like to think that they're man-made. There's nothing artificial about getting a just six-second tube ride on Kelly Slater's wave pool or doing a huge, beautiful carving turn. The sensation is not exactly the same, but the sensation is similar. The sensation is a very connective mind, body, and soul. There's nothing artificial about it. When you say um, you're in a wait and see mode, I'd love to hear a little bit more about what are some of those wait and see decision factors for you? Is it purely about being able to reduce the unit economics, the cost per wave? Is it more about actually scaling up some of these early test pools as they might self-describe and scaling that on a broader level? What are some of those elements of the wait and see that have you most excited? Environmental sustainability is really important to me. And when I say environmental sustainability, I certainly mean energy usage, water usage, the number one priority is obviously safety. For me, there is sort of concern about being involved with a project and then something goes sideways with water quality or there's a perception that, or not just a perception, but a knowledge that the energy usage and the water usage you know, just doesn't fit into sort of environmental focus that I've had for so many years. Since I retired from pro surfing, and then I lost our beautiful son when he was 15 and I went down this different path of empowering people uh, through surfing and getting people to write their code, their commitment and statement of values and connecting with each other and using surfing as a vehicle to tell stories about how sport and lifestyle and nature can connect. I certainly see that there's this opportunity with wave parks and surf parks to do something similar and really use these parks as a way to connect people to the thrill and exhilaration of surfing. And I think if a park is designed sensibly and has a beautiful surrounding and has wonderful trees and flora and fauna, it can be created in such a way that it is almost like a game park. I like the word surf park because South Africa is known for apartheid or apartheid and segregation. South Africa became democratic in 1994 with the election of, of Nelson Mandela. But even during segregation and, and apartheid, there was this environmental consciousness in the entire country. And they established these amazing game parks around the country to preserve the white rhino, the black rhino, and all sorts of other species that were threatened. In some ways, and, and it brought people together and just created these wonderful environments. And it, in some ways, you could create a surf park and have it be this beautiful place where people come to go and can, in some ways, bring people together that are afflicted with one of the fundamental malaises in the world today, and that's disunity. And over the years, I've found that surfing can bring people together of different races, colors, creeds, religions. So these surf parks can be these amazing places of cultural significance. For me, like just from my personal vested interest, uh, when I do these talks to you know, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of people about the code for the next wave, I talk about surfing in a metaphor. But imagine if you had these teams from big companies that I work with Google, Cisco, GM, Disney, and they actually came to one of these parks and they actually experienced this thrill and exhilaration of surfing. I know my process has transformational power and it's at arm's length with surfing. If these people were actually doing the activity themselves, I think it could have a profound effect. 
That's so exciting and empowering to hear about. And I couldn't agree more. There's really no better way. It doesn't matter what the political views or the religious views of someone you're watching get the best barrel of their life. You cannot help but get excited for them, become excited. I agree with the transformational power of just riding waves. There's also some elements of surf parks that you've pointed out as we were preparing for this conversation that has you pretty excited as well. So for example, like the evolution of surfboard design, and you lived through the shortboard revolution. You in many ways led part of this revolution and some of your expertise in tube riding, for example, you were literally from Kelly Slater himself. I watched a video uh, leading up to this of Kelly Slater describing your tube riding in the 70s, 60s and 70s as just even different than how people with three fins, a thruster ride today, you were riding on a single fin. So I'd love to hear some of your perspectives on what opportunities might exist when you have a surf park, a consistent, much more consistent, always on sort of functionality. What happens to surfboards in this new normal? Well, I think there's an amazing opportunity to create design breakthroughs. And, and certainly I'm surprised that Kelly hasn't set up a surfboard factory adjacent to his wave pool. I mean, it's a really simple process, set up a little glassing bay, set up a little shaping bay, and continually fly in the best shapers in the world with the best surfers with a view to creating design breakthroughs. Because you have this perfect stable platform of this perfect wave. So now you're going to experiment on bottom curve. You're going to experiment on thickness distribution. You're going to experiment with outline. You're going to experiment with volume. You're going to experiment with fins. I mean, fins in itself, I think there's a, a massive opportunity because, you know, when they test out a boat, it's computer modeling or it's water tank testing. So now here we have the surf tank testing, which is this perfect platform to create these design revolutions and find out, like, is the way that we've constructed the fin since uh, George Greeno in the mid 60s, it looks sort of like a, a dolphin or a tuna fin. And we've sort of compressed it down to the standard thruster fin that Simon Anderson developed in 1981. And a fin that Al Merrick and I developed uh, shortly thereafter, which has been the foundation for the, the Channel Islands uh, three fin setup. Is that the right fin? Is the fastest and best way through the water to have the two side fins with a flat surface and the exterior part foiled. I mean, is that the best way? Is the fin positioning three or three and a half inches off the back of the way the fins are set up, pointing towards the nose, not pointing towards the nose? What's the perfect angle off the V or the concave? So these are all questions that can be answered in the context of having this perfect wave. For me, there's a massive opportunity there for surfboard design to really dig deep scientifically and also creatively into surfboard design. Well, what I'd like to see is surfboards are designed with two principal factors in mind, okay? One is performance on the wave face, and the other is paddling. And the one mitigates against the other. You know, you've got to be able to paddle the board. It has to have enough volume to support you so you can actually catch the wave. But what about a surfboard? just for riding. No paddling associated with it, just for riding. So Kelly or whoever's got the wave pool can create this little slip and this little chute, just like a snowboarder takes off or a skier takes off a little chute that can enable them to get up and standing and meet the wave face. And then you've got a surfboard that is only designed for one thing, and that's for riding the wave. So how long is the surfboard going to be? Certainly it's going to have to be the width of a human foot so it's going to have to be at least approximately 12 inches wide. But what's the minimum length that you can ride on a surfboard? Is it the width between your feet and maybe six inches behind, six inches in front? I don't know, but these young guys and, and these great shapers can certainly experiment. I remember going to Al Merrick many years ago when he was still in the, in the shaping bay you know, every day. And Al and I have had this amazing relationship. And I said, you know, Al, I had this dream. And I had a dream. It was low tide ring con, perfect. Like low tide ring con at, at four to six feet reminds me in some ways of, of Kelly's way. I said, hey, I had a dream that Kelly Slater was riding a surfboard that you shaped him and it was no bigger than his feet. 
And that was like 25 years ago. And I've always felt that you can create these ultra, ultra, super, super small boards if paddling doesn't even enter into the picture. And then I think young guys and young girls can really take surfing to new levels because there have been some design revolutions in surfing that I have seen. I saw the shortboard revolution. I was riding a eight foot eight surfboard and a couple of Aussies walked down the beach with these plastic, fantastic machines in 1968 and, and it blew my mind. I mean, I saw the revolution walking on the beach that had come in on a 707 from Sydney. I saw the revolution, uh, the twin fin revolution when Mark Richards walked down the beach when I was world champion in 1977 and, and I owned off the wall and back door and he walked down with this six foot four twin fin and he went out there and he caught his first wave and I saw him do that bottom turn and I knew surfing had entered the age of acceleration. I competed against Simon Anderson in 1981 in the Coke Surf About final. Uh, shortly after Simon had won bells on a three fin, I was on a twin fin and he smoked me. And on Monday morning, I phoned up Simon. I said, hey, Simon, I'd love to get one of those boards. And I was the first pro other than Simon that, who got a thruster because I could see that surfing was going places. And it came from the, the minds of incredibly talented people, Bob McTavish and Nat Young, the shortboard revolution, and Midget Farrelly, those three guys. George Greeno certainly played a massive part in that. Greeno Abalero in 1975 at the Coke Surf about and Mark Richards seeing this equipment and then ultimately coming up with his amazing twin and then Simon synthesizing that and going, wow, I've seen these amazing boards from Jeff McCoy, these needle nodes surfboards that Shane Haran and Mark Warren are riding it. I think a single fin's not the way to go. I would put three fins on it. So these moments of great design evolution have come from surfer designer shapers. Today, with the revolution in technology, you don't actually have to be a shaper to design these amazing boards. So someone can sit there at a keyboard at Kelly's Ranch or at a, at a wave garden or at Tom Lockfeld Place and kaboom, on the computer, they can design something up and they can take it out and test it within a few hours. I really think we're going to see some amazing things from a design perspective. And then just the way guys ride waves as well. Like you saw that thing with Kelly and I know, and you know, from 75 to 77 on my single fins, I broke new ground in tube riding, turning and maneuvering inside the tube. And certainly there have been massive advances, leaps and bounds in guys on surfing backside. So the way guys surf backside, principally as a result of Mike Stewart, I think, and Kelly as well, guys can surf backside as good as they surf frontside. But the technique has still been the bottom third of the wave. No one has explored riding inside the tube the top two thirds of the wave. With this type of new equipment, perhaps there's a way for surfers actually to ride the top two thirds. I mean, can they do clean 360 inside the tube? So I think that there's a tremendous amount for development of riding inside the tube. And then I think there's a tremendous possibility to advance the way guys are surfing on the face. And I think that you can create boards with a lot more speed and speed is the key. So if you can really dial in the fins, the volume of the board so that it, it's creating maximum speed, uh, aerials can get higher, aerials can get more creative, aerials can get different. And the carving on the face can be different. So I'm really excited, very excited about what wave pools and, and surf parks can bring to surfing the experience. I'm not talking about surfing the competitive aspect of it, and there's a whole new realm there, but, but to surfing the experience and then translate that and use that advancement to really change how waves are surfed in the ocean. So for me, it's plus, plus, plus. I do not see any negativity associated with a surf pool or a wave park in some ways negatively impacting the soul and purity of surfing. Surf park is just another surf spot. and You have that choice to surf it or not surf it. But a surf park ain't going to poison your relationship with nature or your relationship with surfing in the ocean. And all these people throwing their toys out of the cot, I mean, I'm going like, talk about an extreme reaction. I read on the web how, you know, what's it going to do and how negatively is it going to impact? I'm going like, us. Ah, you discover a new surf spot in the Mentawai Islands 
or you discover a new surf spot in the Azores or you discover a new surf spot in the Marshall Islands. That's cool. What's the negative associated with that? I just think the positives from a cultural aspect, like I say, like Santa Barbara, surf goes slow for a long time. But it'd be great to be able to go, okay, summertime, not much happening in Santa Barbara. I'm going to shift out and I'm going to go and catch a couple of waves at, at my local surf park. Stay in shape, connected to my surfing, experiment a little bit with my boards and have a fun time, perhaps with my son. And the family can go there, have a little, maybe the wife can go to the spa, have a massage. I can get a couple of waves. My son can come with me. It's got so much, I think, positive potential. That is incredible. And I, again, couldn't agree more. I think you've put it so nicely that it's, you know, surf parks are just another surf spot. And just like everywhere else, you can choose to go or not go. What would you say to folks that might be the locals at some of your local Santa Barbara spots or the guys that are and gals that might be a little more skeptical that say surf parks are going to create more surfers more competition in the lineup, harder to get waves, harder to find a spot by yourself. How might you respond to to someone with that kind of point of view? Some surfers have been complaining about the growth of surfing for decades. Pro surfing is bad because it highlights surfing and makes more people in the water. The surfing industry is evil because it makes more people surf. Uh, Sean Thompson, Rabbit Bartholomew, Mark Richards, Ian Cairns, Peter Townend have created pro surfing and surfing has been the worst for it. There are people who see surfing through one lens and that lens has got silver behind it and it reflects their face towards themselves and that's a selfish face. That surfing for me is about my wave, my spot. And when surfing is in trouble, I have found that that is the last surfer that's going to stand up and be counted. When that surf break has an environmental issue or there's a, an, an issue, that person has no interest because all he's interested in is looking at his reflection and seeing if he can get that wave to himself. I think there is a small vein of selfishness that runs through some surfers. And yes, you know, none of us particularly like those intensely crowded conditions. Unfortunately, that's the realization we all have is that the world is getting more crowded and our surf breaks are going to continue to get more crowded. And what can a surf park do? Perhaps not just create more surfers, but perhaps it can alleviate crowds. Perhaps here's a way to create more surf breaks. And by creating more surf breaks, are you going to just create the more surfers that are going to fill in to these new surf breaks and ultimately fill out to natural surfing breaks. I don't know, but just my gut feeling, it's going to alleviate the issue and it's going to make the frenzy associated with that next swell perhaps a little bit diminished. Because when a surfing website says that, you know, we, we got the, the six foot south swell coming or we've got the six foot northwest swell coming and and everyone is on it. And I love the surfing websites. I love the way that, yes, they can pinpoint a swell and can help me decide, like, well, which spot am I going to surf? Am I going to go surf Rincon? No, maybe I'll go and surf Little Rincon. Maybe I'll go to Ventura. Maybe I'll go to the Hollister Ranch. Maybe I'll just surf a sort of a out of the way spot. But perhaps if a guy knows, okay, well, I, I know that Rincon's going to be crowded, but my local surf park, I'm going to go there and in an hour, I'm going to get my 10 waves. Yeah, it's going to cost me something, but I'm going to get my 10 waves, I'm going to get my stoke going, and perhaps it might relieve that uh, pressure. So when I say I'm enthused about them, I'm enthused from a perspective of not having any financial interest. I have no financial interest. I have no motivation to be a booster of a surf park because it's going to put money in my pocket. I just think it's cool because I love these entrepreneurs that are going to go and create these wave pools, and I think it's going to be a great benefit to hardcore surfers like myself and to young people that are starting out on the surfing journey and to families on the assumption that the environmental issue and the sustainability issue and the safety issue sorted out. But I'm seeing it as plus, plus, plus. 
it does seem like a great opportunity as these parks start to develop that the designers, operators, investors in these facilities, those entrepreneurs you mentioned, keep in mind the cultural element and the realities of surf culture today as they design these new experiences and try to facilitate the best elements of that. We do have a lot of those entrepreneurs that have that right positive mindset in place. And it's not just about the dollars. It's about creating something that really gets people excited and makes the world a more fun and stoke filled place. I'd love to transition a little bit and just talk because you mentioned some of your work now related to coaching and supporting commercial organizations as they train their most exclusive talent and other elements. I'd love to hear more about that and how it fits into what you're doing today. I don't really see myself as a coach. I see myself as more of a, um, perhaps an educator and mentor. Certainly I have helped athletes, athletic teams. If someone wants to create transformational change, it can really only come from one place. And that is from redefining your purpose. That's the only way I have found in the 20 years that I've been doing this. With some people that are top athletes, big businessmen, small businessmen, schools, universities, like how can you create, find and refine and define your purpose so you can create some positive change in your life? I found that a really simple process, and I think millions of people have done it. I say to people, write your code, 12 lines. Every line begins with I will, and write it in 20 minutes. And when you've written your code, share it, publicize it, expose it, which creates connectivity with other people that read it and other people that write their codes. But also it creates this explicit and implied accountability. When you write something down and you put our will in front of it, it's a promise, it's a commitment that you've made. So when I do these big events for large corporations and jails, rehab clinics, mental health conferences, leadership conferences, I tell people about the system and I say, this is open source code. It's a really simple code, 12 lines. Every line begins with our will. Write it in 20 minutes. And anyone that's interested can go on my website or they can pick up a couple of my books. It's really profound and it can create amazing change. So what I do is I like to think that I just help people activate their purpose. I don't give a prescription. And coaching is very prescriptive. There's sort of a dogma that the coach knows the way and the players are the pawns and the coach puts them together in a way that they can ultimately be the best team they can be. But my focus is really on the individual and the individual interaction and connectivity within a team. I've been doing this, like I say, for a long time. And I told you I went back to grad school because I was fascinated with this process that I have been doing. And I wanted to get some more academic research and wanted to get some more solid grounding in this process. And the process that I'm involved with is a leadership process. So I went back and studied leadership and did a master of science and leadership at, at Northeastern and came across many, many interesting studies about goal setting and defining purpose and emotional contagion. You know, how all of us can develop this ability to inspire in, and influence others to realize a collective goal. That's kind of leadership. But within that, there's also this ability that we can develop to inspire and influence ourselves to reach our goal. And without writing it down in the form of a code, it's very amorphous. It's very ethereal. And I'm going to make it specific. It's not like a smart goal. You know, they say a smart goal, specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, time sensitive. And you told me, Chris, that you'd studied your MBA. And I'm sure you've certainly come across this because every single MBA student in the world knows about a smart goal. I'm saying a code is different. And the acronym for a code is not SMART, but it's AIM AT. What I do is aspirational. And what people do when they write the code, it's aspirational, it's inspirational, it's moral, it's authentic, and it's timeless. It's not time sensitive. It's like I wrote my code 25 years ago, and I haven't got my wallet here, but I still carry it around with me. And my words, you know, help inspire me. And my words are my North Star. This is a fascinating process. And when people write their codes, what's really interesting is that I've read millions of lines over the years. Because you, you can imagine if I'm seeing 50,000 people a year, and that's 
12 lines of code, that's you know, 600,000 lines a year. I mean, so I've been doing it a long time, so I'm seeing a lot of code, lines of code. People write amazing stuff, beautiful words. I will pray, I will have faith, I'll be a better friend, I'll be a better father, I will do what I say I will do, I will live a life of integrity, I will make a difference, I will be better tomorrow than I am today, I will not look behind me, I will not be a victim, I'll forgive, I'll forgive myself. But people write only two lines which is very reflective of the human condition of humanity, of ultimate meaning and purpose. And if there's one book or two books that I can encourage anyone that's listening to read, the first one is Read Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. Amazing book about purpose and attitude. Read The Five Questions from Peter Drucker. And you, as a theorist of management, you have studied and heard of Peter Drucker, the greatest management or leadership theorist of all time. And Every single hot shot in like leadership theory has ripped off Peter Drucker, the five questions that we all have to have, simple process of self-analysis. And I suggest pick up my little book, The Code. I'm, I'm not saying that I'm in the Viktor Frankl, Peter Drucker class, but it's a, if you're interested in surfing, you know, there's my wife there. Uh, <laughs> it's a fun read and it's really, really simple. What I've discovered by reading all the codes, and people write everything different. People write two things. I will be better. So that is one of the things that they write, that we have this inbuilt desire and compulsion to be better. We don't want to just sit on our asses. We want to be better than we are. It's great to read these codes that are in this river, this tributary of this river of love. The one tributary, I will be better. And the other one is, I will help others be better. It's amazing that the human condition is not selfishness. Yes, we want to be better. We want to just be the best we can be because it's a pure mission. And the other aspect of our pure mission of the two rivers of life that are joined is that I'll help others be better. And it's amazing to see that. And it's amazing to see that in the context of this surfing and how, for me, surfing is the spear into people's consciousness. Surfing is the spark gives people this enlightenment and this jolt of a different perspective. So I do two things when I give a talk. I give a perspective and I give the code. So first perspective and people, I tell some stories. That's all I do. I tell a few stories, two, three, four, five, sometimes maximum five stories. I tell some stories about my life. No prescription, just perspective. I give a perspective. And through my perspective, people see their, their, their own perspective. And it's pretty cool to see people get ready to then write their code. When I start my presentations, and I went virtual in March when, when this whole thing happened, because my whole business disappeared. You know, my speaking business disappeared. So I thought, I'm going to go virtual. I want to see if I can get this emotional connectivity. And I started in March. And my first client was Gilead Sciences. So Gilead Sciences, it's a massive multi-billion dollar multinational that developed the first cure for COVID. It's called Remdesivir. So they were under the spotlight. Their thousands of employees were under tremendous pressure. So I did a series of four events for them. So I started off the events, you know, I spoke to the, the crew there and I said, you know, what are your people feeling? And they said, well, they're unbelievable pressure. They dislocated, they're under pressure. We've got this drug coming out. It's going to revolutionize the treatment for COVID. So I start the presentation. I said, give me one word that describes how you're feeling. And people text me or they go online and they send me a word and through this like amazing technology I use, it all comes up on a screen, on my, comes up across on my shared PowerPoint and it creates a word cloud. So you see all the words agglomerate together and then you see the most common words will be bigger than the other words. Stress, anxiety, despair. Those were the three words, big words. I call it a sad state of mind. Stress, anxiety, despair. That's the malaise, that's the problem that people are faced with. And then there would be other words, but 80% of the words were negative words. You'd have some words hope, you'd have some words opportunity, but most of the words were like stress, anxiety, despair. You know, people were down there, 80%. So what was cool is then I would talk, people would all write their codes together, 20 minutes, we'd have a countdown clock and beautiful imagery that my wife had created and beautiful photos. So while people are writing, they're, they're these beautiful images, and now they've got their codes. The thousands and thousands of people that are on the, on the live stream have got their codes. So I say to people, send me one line about being better. Kaboom, the lines come in. 
I'll be a lifelong learner. I'll be a person of integrity. I will do what I say I will do. And these amazing words, amazing lines come in, 100% positive. And then I say, okay, now the next part of our life purpose is I will help others be better. Send me a line about I'll help others be better. And boom, these amazing lines come in. I'll be a better father. I'll be a better friend. I will do what I say I will do. And just now everyone is seeing these words 100% positive. And I don't say, look, there's been a quantum change from 20% positive to 100% positive, but certainly people are perceptive enough to realize that our fundamental choice in life, and you can read Viktor Frankl's book, one of the greatest books that's ever been written, our fundamental choice in life is our attitude. I call it perspective, but that is what we choose. And if you ask people to redefine who they are, and they look deep into their hearts and their souls, they will find this amazing light inside of themselves, and they write it, and now they've written it, they become accountable, but also they're connecting everyone together. So everyone's now around the world, they're, they're at their home offices, they're with their kids trying to homeschool them, and there's all this drama, but now they're connected. They're connected together by these amazing value statements and by these statements of purpose, by these statements of connectivity and spirituality and faith. And what have I done? I've uplifted and inspired people. I'm stoked to do that. And then people have inspired and uplifted themselves and everyone else, and they've connected with each other at a deep emotional level. And that's what I do. And I'll tell you what, I served some of the most unbelievable tube rides in the world. Man, I've been in the barrel churning and driving at Bechtel Pipeline on the cusp of life and death, and you get spat out and you're flying above the surface of the water and you feel like couldn't be better than this. When I do what I'm doing now, I get the same type of feeling. It's awesome, and I'm so stoked that I found this path. That is so incredible, and I feel better just hearing you describe it. It's so empowering. The contagious positive effect is you have the data to show it. That's so empowering to think about, and I love that story. You, know, you spoke and about data, and you spoke about science. People might think, oh, well, you know what Sean's doing is like a kumbaya vibe. It's like Tony Robbins vibe. It's all this uh, rah-rah positivity. I believe in a positive attitude. I do believe in optimism. And I do believe that we fundamentally choose our attitude, just like if you read the book by Viktor Frankl, you know, one of the greatest psychologists, psychiatrists, theorists of the human condition. But science, there was a study the biggest social study in the history of the world, 689,000 people with Facebook and the National Academy of Sciences. And if someone has an interest, they can look it up. Just go Facebook, National Academy of Sciences, study on viral contagion. And they showed that we can influence others' behaviors, emotions, and attitudes by what we write and send out virally. They did this study. And I'll guarantee you that the Russians, the Chinese, they looked at this study and they went, whoa, we can influence at long distance others. And that's why there was a tremendous uh, outside influence on the election in 2016, because the data was there already, how to do it. The data is there that all of us have this fundamental power to influence others, fundamentally. So all of us have this reservoir of power that we can use for the positive or for the negative. We are all facing this battle. And every time you go out there and you send out a cynical, mean post, that post is a wave. Rob Stone create a ripple, build a wave. I say that all the time. I say drop a stone, create a ripple, build a wave. You can fundamentally impact others with this wave. I was so excited about this study and I was so excited about this science behind this concept of contagion, drop a stone, create a ripple, build a wave, that I wanted to see if it was possible to create a wave across the country. So I went to Kelly Slater's wave pool <laughs> and I said to Kelly, how much your wave costs? 30 million bucks, I think. I think it's like 30 million bucks. And I went, wow, Kelly is creating this amazing wave. It's uplifting and inspiring many people. Exactly like the work I'm doing. But at Kelly's Wave Pool, maybe only 5,000 people a year. 
is it possible to create a wave across the country? So I talk about it and I show a picture of me riding Kelly's wave backside and getting my first wave there, pretty cool wave. Okay, okay, now I'm going to South Africa, getting a big sponsor, financial sponsor, getting a book sponsor, and I'm going to see if I can create a positive wave across the country by getting kids to inspire each other with their codes. But I start out with the wave pool metaphor, and it's so cool that all the wave entrepreneurs, they're inspiring and uplifting people. We are doing the same thing. They're doing it literally. I'm doing it metaphorically. That's why I am so enthused in this process. When you drill down, surfing has unbelievable power to transform positively millions and millions of people. You can do it vicariously and metaphorically like I do, or you can do it literally like the surf park guys do. And that's why I love what's happening. If you've come across many people writing in their codes, I want to fail more and learn from it. Because I think surfers intuitively fall all the time. You mentioned this as a, a fun way to start your TED Talk, which is as a pro surfer, you had your fair share of wipeouts, literally, including being two wave hold downs, the threat of drowning, the darkness, the scariness. But then you get back up and you get back out there and get your next wave. It's very metaphorically tied to the risk that entrepreneurs take including the risks that surf park entrepreneurs are taking now. And I'm curious how you think about failure as a way to learn, if you've identified that as something that can create positive motion. Very much so. One of the most popular stories I tell, it's a really fun story to tell. I frame it in the context of I will always paddle back out. And certainly it's about failure, but it's about hope, optimism, and drive. And I talk about a terrible wipeout at Waimea Bay and just like, just getting so hammered. First wave ever at Waimea, first wave of a final of, of a big pro surf contest, surfing out there on a borrowed board with other competitors, the other guys in the finals that had all surfed Waimea before and, and just getting absolutely hammered and smashed and having a life and death experience and managing to ultimately come up and paddle into my board that was floating in the riptide right near the shore because in those days there were no lifeguards no one on a jet ski to rescue you there was no flotation vest it was just you know your little red shorts your board and the little nylon singlet that you wore i had to make the decision like what do you do do you paddle in or do you paddle back out and you know i lay there and i thought you know what am i going to do and and then i thought now you know i've got to paddle back out and i swung around and i paddled back out and yes it's a story about courage resilience grit but also it's about hope because there's another layer of understanding there, and that is that you know only by paddling back out are you going to get that next wave. But you'll only take that first stroke to paddle back out if you have that hope and faith that there will be a wave out there. It is a great metaphor for surf park operators because certainly you know a lot of these guys are driven by faith, and they have to have this resilience and grit to ultimately achieve their objective. I mean, I read about this new wave pool in Yopun, I think it is, in Australia, which is a completely different concept with this sort of huge pneumatic drum that drops in the water and, you know, creates this swell, but it's a single swell. In some ways, it reminds me of the wave pool that I rode in South Africa so many years. They'd fill up a big cylinder with water and then they'd drop the water and the water would create this wave and here they're creating this big impact and creating this pulse, the swell that really goes on to the five different breaks. But issues that they've had with the floor breaking up and the machine you know, being off balance and the issues that Kelly had with the bottom breaking and the not being able to dampen the wave so that there's only a wave every four minutes. But people keep going. And underlying all of that is not finance and money, but there's an entrepreneur there going, man, I got my ass kicked. I had this wipe up, but I'm paddling out again. And they're paddling out again at a brand new break that kind of no one's ever surfed before. So, I mean, I have a great amount of admiration for these operators, for these entrepreneurs, a great amount of admiration. That is, I think, exactly what many of those folks are going to need to hear. You know, tough times with COVID, but we're already seeing that grit and resiliency come through. And the challenges of these strange COVID times 
present opportunities for surf parks to open in socially distant, safe ways that you can't have at the beach. So maybe even a new angle for surf parks to fill a void that has emerged. But in any case, this has been so fun. And I really just want to thank you again for taking the time to chat today and share your views. And what would be the best way for folks to follow along? Could you share uh, the specific website address for people to join? And if they can follow you on any of the social media platforms, I think a lot of people could get a lot of benefit from just following along with your message. Anyone wants to connect up with me personally, they can just go to my website, seanthompson.com. It's S-H-A-U-N-T-O-M-S-O-N.com. You can always email me, seanthompson at yahoo.com. I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. I do uh, a lot of posting on LinkedIn. I really like LinkedIn. And a lot of people connect, you know, thousands and thousands of people connect with me on LinkedIn. Every now and then, um, we'll do Instagram or Facebook posts, sometimes Twitter. But generally, for me, it's LinkedIn. I encourage anyone that want to reach out to me, just reach out to me. I try to respond to my emails in 24 hours. A lot of people send me LinkedIn messages. And my posts on LinkedIn are not so much business as inspirational and uplifting. I like to think that, you know, what I post on LinkedIn is how I feel, but people are, are having a tough go of it out there. And I try to bring my mom and my father and my family into my LinkedIn posts. I try to bring in business. I try to bring in social activism. And uh, check it out. Connect with me. I love to connect with people. Sounds good. And I'll make sure we link to your site and some of the incredible TED Talks you've given in the show notes. Thank you again for taking the time. This has been a lot of fun and so motivating. And thank you. Good one, Chris. I think it's great what you're doing, bringing together this whole new community and nothing artificial about it. It's man-made pill. <laughs> All right, John. Well, thank you so much. And uh, we'll speak again soon. Hey, everyone. Here's Chris again. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode. For those of you who want more information on surf parks and the topics covered in these episodes, Surf Park Central's insider membership might be for you. Insiders are people serious about surf parks and the organizations they represent. You can join Insiders for a monthly membership fee and rewatch all the surf park summits that have ever happened. You can get transcripts, access to research reports and white papers, even see webinars with special guests like those who visit us on this podcast. So check out surfparkcentral.com slash insiders to learn more about this exclusive professional community for surf parks. Check it out, surfparkcentral.com. Thanks for listening, guys. This is Chris Klusner again, just with a few last minute thoughts. Please do check out our website, beyondoceanpodcast.com to subscribe to our newsletter and get exclusive updates from your local surf parks and out of ocean surfing experiences near you. You can also learn more about our sponsors and the incredible guests we host on the show. You can also access show notes and links. Anything that's covered in the podcast will be featured on the website. Again, it's beyondoceanpodcast.com. Check it out.